go back to the beginning, which yep. for you would be in the choir in Texas. Your family moves to Detroit. Tell me about the early days of church music and your experience with that and how it informed what you wanted to do with singing. Well, originally I'm from Texarkana, Texas. And I was raised by my grandmothers on both sides, my father and my uh, mother, mother. And uh, staying with my uh, father's mother, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was no television back during that time, and a lot of chores. And uh, she was a disciplinarian, and having to go to church sometimes, uh, not only on Sundays but uh, during the week, because you know, church would have different kind of functions and. Uh, I was part of the choir, so uh, and then I used to listen at uh, the radio growing up. And back during those days, I, would, you know, I'm from listening at the Pilgrim Travelers, the uh, Soul Stirs, the Dixie Hummingbirds, the Highway QCs, uh, um, Swan Silvertones, and uh, so I would just lay there and just be knocked out about all that wonderful harmony that they would be making, and uh, being part of the choir, and uh, so. That was uh, where I guess my desire to sing uh, started. And then as it would be back during that time, the great migration to the north, you know, for better work, for, you know, jobs and all that, uh, my uh, parents, my mother, uh, moved to Detroit and then I guess about uh, three or four years later, you know, uh, had me to come up and at that time I was about like, 11 going on 12, and uh, we moved uh, to the lower east side of Detroit. Um, now it used to be Verna Highway, but now I think it's the Chrysler Freeway that's there now. And I stayed not too far from a section that was very, very rough called Black Bottom, where they would really clean your plow if you went there and they did not know who you were or if you did not belong there. So. Um, you know, uh, but I found uh, Detroit to be fascinating because, you know, Texarkana is a relatively small little town and then here I come and uh, to this big city with the tall buildings and the fast cars and all that and uh, so uh, I would spend a lot of times uh, come up there for the summer vacations and then go back to Texas but like I said, there came a point in time that I just came to Detroit and we stayed and um, you know, going to school there and, you know, the comic books and the normal things that kids do as you would grow. But um, then we moved to a little part of Detroit uh, for the um, Brush and Alfred. And when we moved from Verna Highway to Brush and Alfred... I'm uh, sorry, let's cut here for a second. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. We got... um, let's talk a little bit about the excitement of seeing some of those groups that you talked about? You would come to Detroit and with your friends who would melt in? Well, after, after moving to Detroit and being there, oh, I guess for a few years, then we moved to the west side of Detroit, which was, um, to me, a very energized part of Detroit, you know, because uh, uh, that's when we start hearing about Barry and the miracles and Barrett Strong and this fellow by the name of Ron, uh, Ronnie Taylor used to live right across the street from Barry when he had a two-family flat. And we would sit on the stoop and just say, man, wonder what's all that activity going? You see, we would see uh, Barrett Strong and uh, Eddie Holland and uh, Marv Johnson and uh, the Saddened Tones and all kind of people in and out carrying boxes, jumping in this little Volkswagen, riding all over, you know, delivering whatever. And uh, little by little, you know, we... Uh, started singing and I had my own little popular group and uh, I met Barry at St. Stephen's Community Center. Now my group at the time was Otis Williams and the Distance which we had a regional hit and uh, we were very very popular and so we were doing this here record hop at St. Stephen's uh, Community Center and at the time the Miracles were really uh, coming into their own and they had uh, their first million seller shop around. So as we were on the stage performing uh, you can see who's ever coming in or going out uh, of St. Stephen's Community Center because the stage sat real high. And uh, we were doing our number and they wouldn't let us off. They kept calling us back. So finally we came off and uh, uh, the miracles went on and uh, history was made in the men's room. 
So as we, I was in the men room and Barry, you know, came in. He said, "I love your group. You guys are very popular. Bleed out of this and that. If you should ever become uh, unhappy where you are, come see me because I'm starting my own company." So he gave me the card, and we were disenchanted with the people that we were with because you know uh, they. Uh, Sold the masters to a larger company, and the name of the record that we had out that was very popular was Come On. And uh, she sold the masters and came back just flashing big hundred dollar bills and talking about how much money uh, she was making. So we were young, but we were young enough to know that, well, if that's the case, shouldn't we see some statements or royalties? And uh, things started to kind of decline between the company that we were with then and. Uh, so I took Barry up on his offer. I called him and uh, he said, well, come on, on, on over and uh, when you get here, see Mickey Stevens, who was in charge of uh, Motown's A&R division. Yeah, uh, what was, you ask you this one thing. What was Barry Gordy like when you met him? What was your impression of him then? Uh, Barry, as always, very energetic. Uh, knew about uh, bringing certain elements together and making something happen. I mean, he was very wise about uh, what it would take to make a, a song to become a real song and uh, always stress the thing of uh, great lyrical can, uh, content and melodies and aside from him being a very creative person, Barry Gord is actually a funny, funny man because on uh, numerous occasions I would tell him, I said, you really funny because I mean he could do certain things and he'd be acting out whatever he's talking about and his eyes would get big and his his expression again so I was standing there and be laughing so he was a very very rather he is you know uh, still today he's probably somewhat mellower because you know he's not in that uh, same mood uh, now as it was then but very creative funny man to be around right, with a lot of wisdom and insight so it was very very uh, good being around him and, um, you told me once about uh, how uh, um, you used to hear his name on the radio. They would announce his name. They would play a hit record, but yeah. they'd say written by Barry Gordy, and that was an important thing for you. Yeah, it was, because it was almost like Barry uh, was just as important as Jackie Wilson. And they were speaking of Jackie Wilson, who you know was a homegrown uh, uh, talent, and uh, Repetit, To Be Love, uh, um, that's why and uh, quite a few others Barry had written, and at the end of the, you know, the record, they were saying, Jackie Wilson, written by Barry Gordon. And you said, geez, there, is, there his name is again. And then the same thing with uh, Marv Johnson, because he would write Marv Johnson's uh, earlier hits, and Barrett Strong. So this man's name started being just as important as the artist who was singing and performing the, the record, which also made me I'm glad that, you know, at that time listening to the radio and what have you, because when he gave me his card, it just really made me that more uh, happy to be at the right place at the right time, because like I said, we knew of him even while we were over at Northern Records. And uh, so like I said, he had us to come over and we met with Mickey Stevens and we went downstairs and started working on our first few hits. So we must have recorded about like eight or nine records before we really caught on with the way you do the things you do. But we came close to having our first hit in 1962 when Barry wrote Do You Love Me? And few people know it that really was written for The Temptations. But he could not find us that day because there again, see, the temps at that point in time was uh, Eddie Kendricks, Paul Williams, uh, Elbridge Bryant, Melvin Franklin, and myself. Uh, so we were over at St. Stephen's, no, I take it back, King Solomon's uh, Church on the 14th near West Grand Boulevard and Harmonizing Four, Dixie Hummingbird, and two other notables uh, were on the bill, and uh, we had gone to see them. So in the process of us being there, Barry was talking about, where are the temps? I got a smash, where are the temps? And he could not find us. So we came around the next day, and he said, boy, y'all missed it. I said, Miss what? I had a tune for you, couldn't find it, so I had to give it to the contour. So he played it for us, and man, we said, I be damned. Missed out on that one. The impression of why it was so important that you were at the show instead of... Well, we had always been uh, into gospel because uh, even David and uh, before David uh, got in the group, we knew about David, but 
the guys then, uh, Eddie, Paul, all of us, we would rehearse on gospel tunes as well as, uh, you know, secular uh, music. We would open up with, uh, uh, oh, Mary, don't you eat, all that, and the Lord's Prayer, and, uh, you know, just various uh, kind of uh, gospel songs. So it was just steeped in us, because all of us, you know, was from the South. And uh, so that's how a lot of times we would open up our practices with uh, singing gospel music. So when we got wind of uh, the Dixie Hummingbirds coming to Detroit, oh, we had to go see them because, uh, I mean, William Bobo down there on bass and then um, my man only can never think of his name, but uh, his daughter sang with the uh, song with the Supremes, and uh, so the harmonizing four went on and did their bit, and I never will forget uh, as the ha Dixie Hummingbirds was going up. They said they looked down at us. They said, "Now watch what we do," and they went up there and turned the place out. So that's what we were. We were just getting more steeped into uh, that good old gospel harmony. We have to change from. So you, you were uh, talking about Do You Love Me, and uh, it brings up a point about the competitive atmosphere of Motown. In the, in the early days, in particular, it must have felt like a family but you're also we're working against each other to get that hit. Well, you know, being at Motown uh, at the very beginning is was a wonderful uh, experience because uh, the kind of electricity, the kind of fervor that was happening then, we knew even at that very early stage of what was happening that this was a very special place uh, uh, to be. You know, because we had recorded for a little independent companies there in Detroit, but being there with Motown, being there with Barry, and he was such a competitor that he would have that same kind of energy within uh, his company structure uh, as far as writers and producers and uh, artists and what have you, uh, just to bring the best out of uh, everyone. And we were very hungry to the point of uh, it was like a challenge you know, and then we also would help one another, you know, far as, uh, like on Mickey's Monkey, uh, that's um, myself with Martha and the Vandellas and uh, just probably one of the miracles and what have you. So uh, it was whoever needed help, uh, you know, we would be glad to hand clap, background, foot stomp, all that, whatever it would take to help, you know, uh, the situation go. So it was a wonderful experience because it really had that family uh, atmosphere, you know, like no other place. So I knew, you know, that I had a very strong feeling that, you know, we would make it and uh, being there and, and uh, so into it because yeah, I'm sorry. Stand by. Thank you. So we're talking about the family atmosphere at Motown. Let's talk about the real competitive spirit because you guys were hitless for three years and it must have been a family like, well, when's it gonna happen for us? What can we get out of it? But well, yeah, we were hitless for about three years. I think we recorded around about eight or nine, you know, different uh, songs before we really caught hold, you know, with the way you do the things you do. But that was just the way Barry, you know, believed uh, not only in us, the Supremes. At one point in time, they were calling them, them the no-hit Supremes because they had recorded uh, quite a few singles before Holland and Doja got them with uh, Where Did Our Love Go? And so he was a man of vision and strong belief in the artist that he had signed to his company that he would stay right along with you uh, until, you know, it happened. And uh, I, it was just good to have someone that would believe in you to Oh, mister, let's go back again, you know, and so he would try one, I'll show you how uh, strong of a believer he was in us. Uh, Nolan Strong of the Diablos had to see a hit out called Mind Over Matter. And so it was doing very well. And uh, with Eddie singing high in the same kind of tenor range as Nolan, uh, Motown decided to do Mind Over Matter on the temps. But the catcher was that he was going to call us the, he called us the pirates. So now here we are 
this one group working under two different names. Whichever jumped off first, that's what uh, that would have been the route we would have gone. Now, bad as we wanted a hit record, I did not want to be called no pirates. You know, I said, oh, God, if this record jumps off, you mean to tell me we got to come on stage with the patch eye and the feather head and the boots and all that? But uh, it didn't happen, you know. But he was trying whatever route uh, he could to make the temptations happen. And uh, so we recorded that song. Then he had us in the studio with Clarence Paul and Mickey Stevens. Then he took us in with... Uh, uh, he did Dream Come True on us, and then we would go in with uh, uh, Holland Doja, you know, at the very early stage. You know, you put it on the box set, one I have long forgotten. And Let's talk about that for a sec. The, the, the atmosphere of very pitching producers against each other to get a certain fire and a certain kind of performance. Well, he wanted us to have a hit, and then, like I said, with that competitive feeling, uh, you know, he just didn't want nobody to get in no comfort zone, you know, and I guess we couldn't because it was such an early stage of Motown and everybody being, uh, you know, full of uh, uh, hunger and uh, uh, desire to win and to make it that uh, uh, I think everybody thrived off of that kind of uh, competitive feeling that was being generated at the time. And uh, we loved it because it just would bring the best out of it, you know, and uh, so every Friday, I think it was, that they would have a quality control meeting where they would, all that had been recorded that week, they would sit and say, yay, nay, or why is this record uh, what it is, or why isn't it, you know, so they would go back and record it if, it, if they thought the, something was needed and what have you, and uh, so it got to the point that uh, one day we, Smokey uh, and the Miracles were on the road, and they were riding in the station wagon, and they started, you got a smile so bright. And Smokey said, oh, let's do this on the Timps. So, okay, they come in off the road, and naturally, as always, they say, hey, Timps, you know, it's a song you have to record. So we came up to Motown, and we went upstairs, because at that time, the pianos and everything were upstairs, and downstairs was the studio. So we upstairs with Smokey, Smokey sits down at the piano, and he passed the lyrics around, and I'm reading the lyrics, and I said, what? You got a smile so bright, you know you could have been a candle. Uh, I said, that's hokey. But the more I looked you know, at it and we started putting the harmony together, I said, this is some pretty clever stuff. Even though it was very simple, but it had a nice, unique uh, thing about it. And once we put the voices together and rehearsed it and went in the studio and we heard the track and we put it all together, uh, that was the one. Uh, we used to work a lot of different places in and around Detroit. So uh, now this was January of 64. And by that time, David Ruffin had joined the group. And so it was David Ruffin, Eddie Kendricks, Paul Williams, Melvin Franklin, and myself. So we had gone to um, Saginaw, no, Muskegon, Michigan. And we were up there for like three to four weeks. And uh, now Motown was always the place that we would migrate. When we would be home, uh, we would, uh, everyone, the Supremes, the Marvelettes, um, Contours, whoever was at uh, Motown, they would do, we'd just come up there and sit around and chew the fat and just go from one room to another, just having that kind of uh, camaraderie bonding and what have you. But this time when we came back from uh, Muskegon, as always, we would come up to Motown, and so I forgot who it was. They said, uh, have you guys heard what's happening? We said, no, what you mean? So well, y'all got a hit. So it was just David and myself up there that particular day. So I said it again, he said, you guys got a hit. And he went and got the billboard and showed it to us. And I think we jumped in at 76, something like that with a bullet. And at that time, Motown had to see a lounge uh, area and they had a long chase lounge where, you know, when you would come in, you know, people would sit down there to wait to go to whatever appointment that they had. And David, took off his glasses and he sat down and he cried because David had been uh, a solo artist and he did not have, uh, you know, success as a solo artist and he had a name, you know, it just never happened for him and uh, so him and I sat down and uh, we both cried together because it was like three to four years, you know, on trying to get one, you know, I guess the thing of paying dues and uh, bingo, that was the one and the Motown review tours and all kind of accolades and what have you started happening and uh, that was the real beginning of our long worth ethics uh, that we're still carrying on today. But it really 
started taking on a whole nother kind of uh, life form then because uh, the plot thickened. You know, by that I mean uh, uh, we started recording more and then 66, I think it was, that's when artist development was uh, uh, started and it was headed by Harvey Fuqua who used to sing with Harvey and the Moonglows and see Barry had the insight to set this up and pass it on to Harvey. Harvey in turn had the wisdom to find Charlie Atkins and Maurice King and the Johnny Allens and Lon Fontaine's and uh, um, uh, Maxine Powell and Ardina Johnson, you know, all those people, they would take all this raw talent, speaking of the miracles of the four tops, because they had signed, uh, I think in 64 or uh, 63, and uh, contours, uh, even the, the B groups as they referred to, like the monitors and the spinners, and well, they would take all those acts and um, they would take us in and would uh, sit us down and talk to us, which is, something that's missing from the accent that I see on the scene today. And they said, look, we are going to work out an act for you guys so you will not have to worry about if you do not have a hit record, your money will drop and you won't work. So if you're going to be in show business, be in show business the right way. We are going to construct an act, whereas you can work any room. Uh, we want to teach you guys about how to carry yourselves as professionals, how to sit and talk when you're being interviewed, and the whole, you know, nine yards, which I'm very glad because I think uh, part and parcel, that's why we are around 34 years uh, later. Because with all this young talent, 